Good morning again, everyone. Uh, again, this is uh, Dan Brown. I'm one of the senior hurricane specialists at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, welcome to our webinar this morning. We're so happy that you could join us as we are now expanding up the east coast of the U.S., uh, getting up into the Georgia and the Carolinas. So uh, thanks again. Um, the webinar will last about an hour this morning, and about half of that time we're going to have for questions and answers. You see a lot of the panelists up on the screen above. We have uh, uh, one other person that uh, will be joining us. I'll introduce everybody on the panel here in just a second. Uh, but again, about the first half hour will be a presentation where we'll talk about hurricanes, how we forecast hurricanes and hurricane hazards. And then again, uh, get into the, the questions. And you can uh, ask your questions by typing in the question box. You'll see a question uh, box on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, and with that, you can type in questions. We'll answer a few of those as we move through the webinar today, but we'll save a lot of those for the end. Uh, unfortunately, we probably won't get to every single question uh, asked today, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. And I see some folks are already uh, typing in there. Hopefully you can hear us. I see one person saying they can't. Uh, you may have to give uh, the audio control, uh, allow it uh, on your computer, or you can use the, the phone number to call in as well but hopefully everyone else is able to hear us uh, just fine. Uh, with that, uh, let me go ahead and uh, start doing the introductions. So, John, if you can uh, switch me over to the uh, next slide. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, the area that we're covering today is, uh, again, no stranger to uh, hurricanes. Uh, we've, uh, in history, seen a lot of hurricanes uh, impact uh, this region. That's why, again, we all have to be prepared each and every hurricane season. But we go all the way back in time here uh, several years ago to Hurricane Hugo back in 1989. That's a real memorable storm for me because I was living up in Asheville at the time. I grew up in the western part of North Carolina, went to UNC Asheville, go Bulldogs, uh, and uh, was there when Hugo moved through that area after making landfall in the Charleston area. So it's a storm I really remember. And then more recently, we've seen storms, uh, you know, Floyd back in 1999, and then some recent storms like Irene, uh, Matthew, and Florence uh, more recently. Uh, but let me go ahead and introduce now our, our panelists. Uh, I have uh, several people here who uh, all of us work really together as a team when a hurricane threatens the area. So both fo folks from the National Weather Service uh, offices and the Hurricane Center. John, I'm not sure. There you go. I, I just now got the, the new slide showing. Uh, so I'll introduce uh, Robbie up in the uh, top left corner. Robbie Berg is one of our uh, hurricane forecasters at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, Robbie is going to be uh, presenting the second half of our presentation this morning. We're also joined by uh, Nikki Hathaway. Nikki is a flight director, meteorologist on board the NOAA Hurricane Hunter aircraft. So she flies right into the storms, uh, helping collect that data. And she's going to talk about how they do that. Uh, you see me on the screen as well. I've already introduced myself. Uh, and then we have John Cangelosi. Uh, John is also a hurricane forecaster at the National Hurricane Center. He's going to take us through the first part of our presentation this morning. Uh, also joined by Lauren uh, Carroll. Uh, Lauren is from the uh, Greenville-Spartanburg office of the National Weather Service. She's one of the forecasters there, and we'll talk about uh, what they do at the local office. Also joined by Bob Bright. Bob is also a forecaster at the local National Weather Service in Charleston, South Carolina. So we have kind of a coastal perspective, what they do when a hurricane hits at the coast, and also talking about uh, what we have to prepare for inland in hurricanes as well. And lastly, you don't see on the screen yet, but we'll see him uh, in a moment, is uh, Andy Lotto. And Andy is also a hurricane forecaster at the National Hurricane Center. He's going to help me moderate the question and answer period. Uh, so with that, let's get right into it. And I'm going to turn it over to John to start the presentation. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Um, hopefully everyone today is excited to learn about hurricanes. I'm certainly excited to be teaching about hurricanes today. So let's get right into it. Now, everyone you're talking to on the line today, as Dan already mentioned, is a meteorologist. But do you know what a meteorologist does? Well, hopefully you know a meteorologist is someone who studies or forecasts the weather for their job. So you could be a meteorologist if you're on television telling you what the weather is going to be like today, or a whole bunch of variety of jobs like the people you're going to talk to today. The bottom line for everybody listening, if you're out there and you're interested in what we're talking about today, and you feel like you're really good at math and science, I think you have what it takes to be a future meteorologist. So please keep that in mind. And we want to tell you about what we do at the National Hurricane Center and in the National Weather Service. First, greetings from Miami, Florida, everybody. I wish we could be at the center today showing you around, but hopefully you still get a sense of what we do there nonetheless. 
Now, here's a couple of, of a, here's a couple of pictures of our building in Miami, and you can look at the outside here first. You'll get a look at the inside coming up toward the end of the presentation. And when you look at the outside of the building, you might be saying, well, it's not very pretty, but you're right, but it is very, very strong. The building is made of concrete and steel, and it's designed that way to keep us safely working in that building, even if a hurricane comes to South Florida. Now, at the National Hurricane Center, we have a really big job. We forecast tropical storms and hurricanes over a very large area, generally from Africa all the way into the Pacific Ocean to pretty close to Hawaii. So we're almost always busy at work when it's hurricane season. Now, in addition to forecasting hurricanes, we have another important job. We tell boaters, big ships, and other people who spend time on the ocean what the weather is going to be like. So if you ever go on a cruise, or if you like to go offshore fishing, or if you know someone that works on an oil rig or does something out to sea, we want to make sure you're all safe when you're out over the ocean. So we're going to give you forecasts of how big the waves are going to be and how strong the winds are going to be to make sure you stay out of the really rough conditions. Now, as Dan mentioned when he introduced everybody, you might have heard of the National Weather Service. And you might be thinking, well, where is the National Weather Service located? Well, the good news about the National Weather Service is they're located just about everywhere across the United States. Now, today, since most of you listening are from the three states of Georgia, South, and North Carolina, we have a few special guests, as Dan introduced in the beginning, to describe what is done at some of these local National Weather Service forecast offices. And first, we're going to go to Bob, who's in the Charleston, South Carolina area. So if you live in that portion of South Carolina, I think you should pay, you should pay extra special attention to Bob. So Bob, uh, feel free to tell everybody what you guys do at the office. All right. Hey, thank you, John. Um, good morning, everybody. So at the National Weather Service in Charleston, um, as you can see on the screen, hopefully, you know, we're, we're here 24-7, 365, so we never close, uh, close down. We're always here watching the weather. Uh, when most people are sleeping, we're here um, watching and, and, and trying to warn folks if there's hazardous weather, like bad storms. Um, but really what we do, uh, we work with folks like the TV media, uh, the people you see on TV, and especially the emergency management folks who are responsible for um, training everybody and keeping everybody aware of what are the, the hazards in the area. And um, a lot of those hazards obviously are weather related. So we try to keep them informed about um those hazards and and those those risks risks so especially during obviously when we have um when we're in tropical season and we have tropical threats like hurricanes um we work very closely with the national hurricane center and with those partners um to try to get those messages out um as best as we can to help keep you safe um, one of the cool things we do here is at our office and not every office forecast office does this but what we do is we release the weather balloons um, two times a day and they go high up um, for about 20 miles high in the sky and we track it for a couple hours but that gives us a lot of weather data um, for our computer models and those computer models help us predict what kind of weather we might see in the future and especially important when we're trying to predict, you know, where the tropical storms and hurricanes might go. Um, and when there is a threat, like a tropical threat, we do release those balloons more than two times a day, usually four times a day. So it can get quite busy. You can see on the screen um, kind of what our operation look like. There's a lot of people here in that middle picture down below. Um, so that was during Hurricane Dorian last year, and you can see uh that we have a lot of folks in the office um working on things so um again that's pretty much all we do we cover uh, 20 different counties across southeast south carolina and southeast georgia so that includes savannah as well that's another big area um, also statesboro georgia walterboro south carolina so um, we also cover the atlantic 
uh, waters. We forecast out there and, and issue warnings for, for mariners as well. So quite a few things we do. Um, and thanks again for joining us this morning. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that. All right, let's now head uh, a little bit upstate in South Carolina and head to Lauren from the Greenville Spartanburg office. Hi, everybody. Thanks, John. Uh, good morning from Greenville, South Carolina. Um, we are actually located at the Greenville Spartanburg Airport in upstate South Carolina, but our office forecasts the weather for 46 counties and those go all the way from the mountains of North Carolina. So that includes Asheville. I know Dan is from right around there, grew up right around there. Uh, and then we go all the way over to the Tennessee border. And then we actually go all the way east towards Charlotte in North Carolina. So hello, if you're uh, on from Charlotte, you probably actually remember some of the storms I'm, I'm gonna mention here in just a minute. And then we also cover our area where I'm located in the upstate of South Carolina. So we forecast the weather for all those areas. We're at the office 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just like all the other weather forecast offices uh, in the country. And we also issue watches and warnings for bad weather that happens. And we forecast severe weather here, including, you know, a lot of you probably have heard about the tornadoes recently. We also forecast winter weather. And then when we have any type of tropical threat coming towards us, I have a picture of Florence down at the bottom and some of Flooding, actually, we got in Charlotte from Florence. If you remember Florence, you probably remember in Charlotte getting a day off of school for that because of all the flooding. Um, but when that happens, when we have a tropical threat that comes towards us, that's when we coordinate with the folks at the National Hurricane, Hurricane Center, uh, the guys that are on this morning, uh, too. And we talk to them. They tell us the track that they expect of a storm. Uh, they tell us expected wind speeds, things like that. And then we take that information and we break it down and tell more specifically what we think is going to happen in our area. Uh, for example, any tropical storm that moves inland and gets towards us, that can cause a lot of issues with flooding and debris flows uh, in our mountains. And so that's the stuff that we deal with at the local level, talking to our emergency managers and getting our local folks prepared for threats like that, all types of severe weather and tropical weather as well. Thank you, Lauren. And everybody listening, if you're interested in specific weather for your area, if you're from South Carolina, North Carolina, or Georgia, make sure you ask Bob and Lauren all the questions you can in that question box. All right, now let's talk specifically about hurricanes and hurricane science. Hopefully you can see this animation on your screen of a satellite picture of Hurricane Harvey back in 2017. Now when looking at this satellite animation, which is showing you where all of the clouds are of this hurricane, what catches your eye? I bet it's this big hole right here in the middle, am I right? That's called the eye of the hurricane. And the eye of the hurricane is a really weird place to be. Because believe it, or not, believe it or not, in the eye of a hurricane, it's almost calm. It can get sunny or clear at night, and the winds can really come down. But I say it's weird because right outside the eye, in this area here, is called the eye wall, where is, it is the worst place to be in a hurricane, where the winds are the strongest, the rain is often the heaviest, and unfortunately, where the damage tends to be the worst. Beyond that, in these areas that I'm circling are where the rain bands are. And the rain bands can be a pretty bad place too. The winds can be gusty and you can even see tornadoes in that area. Now just take a big look, look at this picture here. It's almost amazing and beautiful, isn't it? Mother Nature truly produces some amazing things, but it's hard to call hurricanes amazing or beautiful if one strikes the area where you live. Now, you probably know that we give hurricanes names. I already mentioned Hurricane Harvey, and I heard Lauren mention Hurricane Florence. It's how we communicate about hurricanes. But another way we communicate is by giving them a category or a group. Now, decades ago, we had these two men work together. Herb Saffer, who is an engineer, and Robert Simpson, a meteorologist that helped design this scale. And the scale shows you how strong the winds are in the hurricane. But remember, only the winds. We're going to talk more about other hazards coming up. And Lauren already mentioned rain, so keep this in mind. The scale is only about the winds. Where Category 1 hurricanes have winds between 74 and 95 miles an hour, 
Then the wins increase with each category. And by the, by the time you get to a category five, the winds are at least 157 miles per hour. So that's just incredibly powerful winds. Now you might be wondering where these hurricanes typically go. In particular, where do the strong ones go? These major hurricanes, which are category threes, fours, and fives on the scale. Well, let's take a look together. Each one of the lines you see here indicate the path of a major hurricane. Remember, those are category threes, fours, and fives. Now, where the lines turn yellow, it shows you where the storms were at their strongest. So let's first look where the strongest ones go. Generally, from the Gulf of Mexico, across Florida, and then across the Bahamas here and into the Western Atlantic. This zone here has seen the strongest hurricanes in history. Now, although most of the listening are not in that zone, still in a zone that sees a lot of hurricanes, Georgia, South and North Carolina, lots of red and yellow lines through your area, which means history shows us that you guys see a lot of hurricanes. I'm sure you already knew that. But remember, you're not alone. You can see across the entire Atlantic Basin, including the Caribbean, even up to Canada, sees hurricanes. Remember, the bottom line is, if the waters are warm, generally around 80 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer, hurricanes can get close to where you live. Now, since most people are living in the three states we mentioned, I thought it would be great to look at a little history for each state. Let's start with Georgia. Each one of the lines show you the path of a different tropical storm or a hurricane where the lines are purple and orange indicates where the storms were stronger and where they're blue or green indicates where they were weaker. Now in Georgia history, you can see there's lots of lines. Most of the hurricane tracks generally come across Florida and into Georgia. So since Georgia has a pretty small coastline, there is a chance that that coastline like Brunswick or Savannah could see a direct hit but a lot of Georgia is vulnerable for the inland effects from these hurricanes. What about South Carolina? A lot more lines there than Georgia. South Carolina starts to stick out there in the Atlantic Ocean, and you can see there have been lots of direct hits on South Carolina. Again, if you look here, most of the tracks generally go from south to north, but every once in a while, one comes from the east to west. How about North Carolina? Wow, even more hurricane tracks in North Carolina, especially across the eastern half of the state. And if you ever look at a map of the United States, you'll notice that North Carolina is kind of sticking out there in the Atlantic Ocean, which does give it some beautiful beaches, but also gives it a risk of seeing impacts from a hurricane. And North Carolina gets hit probably the second most in the United States behind Florida. So if you're in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, given the history, I hope you're very much hurricane ready and hurricane prepared, given how vulnerable it is in the areas where you live. All right, now you didn't think we were gonna just let you sit there and listen to us the whole time, right? We want you to participate. We wanna test your hurricane knowledge. So we're gonna ask you a few quiz questions. You are going to see a poll on your screen. I want you to know what you think the correct answer is. Here it is. When is the Atlantic hurricane season? Do you think the right answer is A, May through November, B, December through April, C, June through November, or do you think the answer is D, all year long? All right. I think Robbie or Dan will be opening the poll shortly, so please vote once you see that. There's the poll. Please vote. June to November. 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 Okay, I see the results are coming in. I'll give it a few more seconds here. Looks like quite a few people have voted. Let me go ahead and close the poll. And uh, John, it looks like about two thirds of the folks said June through November. Let's see if I can share the results real quick. About two thirds of the folks said that June through November, 
another quarter mm -hmm. of the folks said May through November. I'll let you give them the answer. Well, I just actually flashed it on the screen accidentally, Dan. It is the June through November. Congratulations if that's what you ch chose. And it looks like, Dan, most people got the right answer. So way to go, which means hurricane season's about a month away. So hopefully we're starting to think about hurricanes and getting ready. Now, officially hurricane season is happening. All right, hopefully everybody can hear me. I inadvertently got unmuted or muted. Hurricane season is officially half the year, June 1st through November 30th. So we want you to start getting ready. And you might think, well, when is it the busiest? Well, take a look at the picture here. At this point in time, which was in the month of September in 2018, we had five systems that we were watching from the National Hurricane Center. This one, Hurricane Florence that Lauren mentioned earlier, which as you probably remember, struck the Carolinas in 2018. This one over here, Tropical Storm Isaac that moved across the Caribbean. This one, Hurricane Helene that stayed over the Eastern Atlantic. Another system in the Gulf of Mexico that affected Texas and Louisiana. And then another system here off the coast of Africa that stayed out to sea, fortunately. So that leads us to this. When do we typically see the most hurricanes? Well, take a look at this campfire graphic with me. Now, whether you look at the red area, which shows you hurricanes and tropical storms together, or the yellow, which is hurricanes by themselves, you generally get the same answer. Do you see that? <clears throat> that the peak in the season occurs right here, September 10th, right in the middle of September. And the bottom line, everybody, is there's three months of the year that we want you to be the most ready. And those three months are August, September, and October. So don't be too surprised if the season gets off to a quiet start in June or July. That's what typically happens. We want you to be ready, but we want you to be the most ready for those three months that I just mentioned, late in the summer and into the fall. All right, you ready for your next hurricane quiz? Let's hope you do well here. <clears throat> now, this one, everybody, is not a poll question. So what we want you to do is just think about the question and then just scream out the answers in your house. Or if your parents are telling you to be quiet, maybe just whisper. Here's the question. What are the primary hurricane hazards? Do you think the right answer is A, high winds, B, storm surge, C, heavy rainfall, D, dangerous surf along the beaches, or do you think it's E, all of the above? Okay, I'm gonna give you just a second or two to think about it. Are you ready? The correct answer is E, all of the above. Hopefully that's what you were thinking. That is the correct answer. But the good news here is, is whatever you picked, any of those answers weren't wrong. All of them are really important hazards. Now you might be saying, how can I remember all these hazards? There's so much going on when it comes to hurricanes. We get that. So we came up with a word to help you remember them. The word that we came up with is called SWIFT, where the S in the word SWIFT stands for storm surge. Now Robbie's coming up next after me and he's gonna tell you specifically what storm surge is and what it can do. For now, just know that's the water that comes in off the oceans and the bays and floods neighborhoods where we live. The W in the word SWIFT stands for wind, of course, you know that. We already talked about the categories, no, it's windy and hurricanes. The I and the F stands for inland flooding, which could be a really big deal, and Lauren already showed you some crazy pictures of that flooding. And the T stands for tornadoes, which, as we mentioned earlier, can be very damaging in some of the hurricanes' rain bands. Now, in addition to these hazards, I also want you to remember the waves and rip currents. So, even if a hurricane recurves out in the middle of the Atlantic, far away from the coastline, you could still see really big waves and really rough beach conditions, even if it's a beautifully sunny day. So remember, when it comes to the beach conditions, pay attention to meteorologists like Bob and others along the coastline about when it's a good idea to avoid the beaches, even if it's a beautiful day. 
All right, ready for another question? Let's do it. Let's hope you do as the first one. Now, this is a poll question. So after I read it, just like before, you're going to see a pop up on your screen asking you to select what you think the correct answer is. Are you ready? Here is the question. Which hurricane hazard that we just talked about has unfortunately produced the most deaths in the United States? Do you think the right answer is A, wind, B, storm surge, C, flooding, or D, tornadoes? Good luck. This one is a tricky one. The poll is open. Hopefully, everybody gets the right answer. Thanks, John. Uh, watching the results come in. A lot of people voting. Remember to vote in the uh, the poll. I saw a few folks vote in the question box. So hopefully everybody can can answer the poll. I saw a few issues with that as well, but hopefully you're able to select an answer. Looks like about 70% of you have answered the question, so that's a bit higher than last time. Give it another 15 seconds or so, and then I'll close it out. Okay, it looks like most of the votes are in, so let me close the poll and see if I can share those results. Pretty close vote. Uh, looks like about 40% of the folks said flooding, another 26% said storm surge, 30% said tornadoes, and wind was last with 5%. Uh, so with that, uh, now we're gonna turn things over to uh, Robbie, who's gonna take the uh, second portion of the webinar. I'll say that uh, both Robbie and Bob, I didn't mention in the introductions, uh, or NC State graduates, so from the area uh, up there. And uh, I'm surprised Robbie doesn't have an NC State shirt on or paraphernalia uh, next to him with the Go Wolfpack. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So uh, hopefully everybody can see uh, my screen now. So the, the answer to the question that you all just voted on is actually, as the letters go away, it's B, storm surge. So actually really proud of everybody for the answers it provided because um, B is the right answer, storm surge. And I was proud because not very many people said wind. If I was to go and ask most adults that question, you know what they would say? They would say that the winds from a hurricane are what's most important. Uh, and that's generally most what most people think about. That's how we group these hurricanes. John talked about the Sapper Simpson hurricane wind scale. So everybody thinks about wind, but in reality, it's the water that most people should be thinking about when it comes to these storms. Here are some pictures on your screen of the different types of water events that you can have from a hurricane. So the upper left picture here with the boats in the water, that was actually from Harvey, which hit the Texas area a couple years ago. This is from Houston, Texas. Harvey caused a lot of heavy rainfall over many days, and you can see that the roads there got so flooded uh, that people had to be rescued from that heavy rainfall. Uh, so that's one big concern that we have with these storms. Uh, an example of a, a picture in the lower left is, I think this is actually from the coast of North Carolina. Uh, this is from storm surge that came from the ocean and moved on to the outer banks of North Carolina and caused all of that flooding uh, on that part of the coastline. And then you can see another picture here on the right of some more water. So it's really the water that most people unfortunately do die from in these storms. And what you're gonna see now on your screen is a pie chart, which shows you the percentage of how people die from these storms. So what you're noticing here is that storm surge, that dark blue part of the pie chart says 49%. So about half of people in the US who have died from tropical cyclones, hurricanes, tropical storms are from storm surge. Uh, and then in that kind of aqua color, it's that kind of the color of my shirt here, it says rain, which is 27%, so another quarter. If you add up all of the water-related hazards there, you can see that about nine out of 10 people die from water, not wind. So again, I was proud of you guys for the, answering that question correctly and not choosing wind. And I want you to go back and tell your parents and your other friends and family that we need to be worried about the water from these storms, whether it's from storm surge from the ocean or the heavy rainfall that falls from the sky uh, and also the waves along the coast. We need to be worried about the water because unfortunately that's what does uh, take more lives than the other hazards. So let's talk about storm surge real quick. Uh, John was referring to that a little bit before. We wanna show you another picture of what the storm surge can do. So what you see here on your screen is a picture of a nice sunny day in New York City. This is actually in East Village, part of Manhattan. And 
as you would expect, people are walking around, there's cars driving around. I want, to wa want you to watch this intersection, especially here on the screen, you see these red doors on this building across the intersection. Because what I'm gonna show you next is what happened and what this intersection looked like when Hurricane Sandy hit New York City in 2012. So what do you see now? Well, that whole intersection was underwater. So what happened in Sandy is Sandy was a very large hurricane, category one, and all of that wind from the storm pushed the ocean water into the city, onto land. And so a lot of the streets and roads in the city got flooded by water. And that water there that you're seeing is salt water. It's not fresh water from the sky, it's actually salt water from the ocean. So it's pretty amazing what these storms can do because they, they, the wind is so strong that it can push the water from the ocean onto land. And so it's not safe to be in these areas when uh, you might actually end up getting the storm surge. That's why we tell people to stay safe. And in this case, get into higher floors of the building. And sometimes we tell people to evacuate before the storm to get out of those areas that could get the storm surge. Now, one thing that happened in Sandy as well is that there was storm surge along the coast, but then there were also really big waves on top of the storm surge. So you think you go to the beach on a sunny day and you see waves along the coast on the beach. Well, in a hurricane, those waves get really angry and they get really big. And what you can see here that happened along the coast of New Jersey is that the storm surge came up, the water went on land, and the waves pushed all of these houses into one another along the coast. So there was a lot of damage along the coast of New Jersey because of the storm surge and the really high wave action. So as you can imagine, this is not a place you'd want to stay if a hurricane was coming because you wouldn't want to be in one of those houses uh, when it got pushed off of its foundation. So that is again why we have to get people out of the way and away from the beach when a hurricane is coming. Okay, so let's turn from the salt water hazard and storm surge to the rainfall hazard, rain falling from the sky. So what you're seeing now is an interstate, a roadway in Houston, Texas. This is what it looks like on a normal day. You see the traffic's flowing really well. Well, in 2001, we had a tropical storm named Allison. Now, it wasn't even a hurricane. It didn't have winds of 74 miles per hour or greater. The winds actually were not that strong. But Allison produced a lot of very heavy rainfall over several days. And so what happened is that rain had nowhere to go and it filled up the roads. So here's a picture of what that same roadway in Houston looked like after Allison had hit the area. What do you notice? Look at all those semi-trucks that got caught in the heavy rainfall in the floodwaters. So those truckers were driving along the interstate the water started coming up because of all that heavy rainfall and they ended up getting stuck. They couldn't move anymore. So it's possible that some of those truck drivers had to be rescued if they got caught in the cabs of their semi trucks. So you can see here that the rainfall is a big deal. Sometimes we can get a lot of rain. And I know you guys in the Carolinas and Georgia are well aware of storms doing this. You think of storms like Lawrence, which we had a couple years ago, Matthew, I know in the, in the Charleston area, we had a hurricane that stayed offshore, Joaquin, and it still caused a lot of heavy rainfall even along the coast and it was still that far away. So you guys have seen a lot of heavy rainfall events from these hurricanes and tropical storms. Um, and that's one of the hazards that just happens to come with these storms. So again, the water is really important in these storms. Okay, also we wanted to touch on the tornadoes and water spouts that can occur with these storms. You can see some pictures of these tornadoes and water spouts. Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, a tornado, as most people are probably aware, it's this kind of funnel looking cloud feature that comes down from the, cloud, the sky down to the ground. And when it's on the ground, those winds are really strong and it can cause wind damage uh, when it does uh, hit these buildings and homes. Now, a water spout is pretty much the same thing, except it's occurring over the water. So you might be asking, okay, well, what about this one here on the beach? It's going from water on the left side of the screen to land on the right side of the screen. Well, when it's over water, we call it a water spout. And when it moves onto land, we call it a tornado. And so sometimes, as I think John mentioned earlier in the talk, in the outer rain bands around the storm, you can often get these tornadoes and water spouts forming. And if they do come onto land, like this water spout did, then they can cause some damage uh, to homes, businesses, and hotels, as you might imagine, being there along the coast, along the beach. So 
Uh, this is just another hazard that we have to be watching for. And these can often form well out ahead of the storm uh, before the worst conditions actually get to you. Last hazard we want to touch on are waves and rip currents. You don't even have to have a hurricane making landfall or anywhere near you for this to be a problem. It can be an, actually a bright, sunny day, a nice beach weather, uh, but the waves and the rip currents could be really bad. So a rip current is, as you see here on the bottom left part of your screen, you see that little current of water that's moving away from the beach through that channel? Well, that's a rip current. So if you were swimming along the beach there and got caught in that current, it could drag you out into the ocean. So uh, because those currents can be pretty strong, you can get tired by trying to fight it, and we have seen people drown in those rip currents. So we always tell people to swim along the beach, not away or toward the beach, but swing, swim parallel to the beach to get out of that current, uh, and then you'll, you won't get so exhausted, and you can actually either swim then back to shore, get on the sandbar, or a lifeguard can come out there and help you. So uh, again, you don't have to actually have a hurricane making landfall in order for this to be a problem. So when you go to the beach, always look out for these flags that the lifeguards will be posting so you can see what is the risk of waves and rip currents on that particular day. So at the Hurricane Center, there are lots of different things that we're looking at to try and figure out where a storm is going to move and how strong it's going to get and will it affect you. You can see here on the screen that we look at data from ships and buoys and from satellites. We have airplanes that fly into storms. We have radar that we can look at. All of these different kind of data sources are come into play and we use them to try and get an understanding of where the storm is located and how strong it is. Then once we've determined that, we use computer models, which actually simulate what's going on in the atmosphere and can help tell us what they think is going to happen with the storm in the future. So we'll use upwards of five or more of these computer models to try and determine where we think as forecasters, the storm is going to go and how strong it's going to get. So there's a lot of different tools that we have at our disposal in order to make these particular forecasts. Now, one of the things I mentioned was the airplanes. And yes, we do fly airplanes into hurricanes. So what I was gonna do at this point is pass it over to Nikki, uh, who's gonna talk about uh, actually flying into hurricanes because that's one of her jobs in the NOAA Aircraft Operations Center. Sure if we hear Nikki or not, you there? Oh, I think we lost Nikki. She seems to be muted. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on with the sound. So we'll see if we can get that worked out and get Nikki back on here in, in a bit. So yeah, so we do fly these fly planes into, our, into these storms, they're hurricanes, and there are two different kinds of groups that fly into storms. We have the NOAA group, which is the agency that we work for, and they fly planes both into the storm. As you can see, this one plane here, it's called the NOAA P3 aircraft. And then the one on the left is the NOAA G4 aircraft, and that one flies above and around the storm. So it doesn't actually move or fly right into the storm. It goes around and above. In addition to NOAA, we also have the Air Force, which flies into storms. And you can see their, their plane, the C-130 there, uh, they do fly that plane right through the eye wall and into the eye of the hurricane. As you can see here is a picture from taken from within the eye of a hurricane. What do you notice? Well, remember when John was talking about earlier how it can be clear within the eye of a hurricane? So here's the eye wall. All these clouds are the very strong winds, the heavy thunderstorms and rainfall. But when this plane was in the eye, they looked up to the sky and they actually saw blue sky. So again, as John was saying, it's kind of a weird feeling probably being in that eye and that you know all that bad weather is occurring, but when you're in the center, it's really clear up above you. So uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. And maybe when we get to the question and answer part, we'll see if uh, Nikki's back on and she can answer more questions about what it's like to fly into the hurricane. So as we get toward the end here, uh, we want to talk about how do we get the forecast to you? So we make a forecast, where the storm's going to go, how strong it's going to get, but then we have to tell you about it. And we sometimes are on television, we use radio, we talk to newspaper writers, article writers, and we use social media. So all of these different channels 
are things that we use to tell you what the forecast is going to be, and then that helps you to get prepared before a storm is going to hit. So you can see pictures here. This is from within the, within the National Hurricane Center when there were some big hurricane events. Look at all the cameras that are camped out there, taking pictures, interviewing people, interviewing forecasters, uh, so that they can then broadcast that information out to the world and keep people safe when there's a hurricane. So speaking of keeping people safe, we want you to, to know that Hurricane Preparedness Week is coming up. 2020, that's this, this year. And we need people to start getting ready for hurricane season because the season technically starts June 1st. So we're about a month away. Uh, you can see there's a web link there in the bottom, www.weather.gov slash WRN slash hurricane dash preparedness. Uh, we'll put this link back on the last slide as well so you can uh, see it, maybe take a picture of it if you need to. Uh, but this is a website you can go to to get all the latest information on what kinds of uh, evacuation plans you should be thinking of, you and your family, what kinds of supplies you might need to get before a storm. Uh, it's a really good resource. In fact, you know, many of our families use this resource to make sure that we have all the supplies ready to go before hurricane season. So check it out when you get a chance after we log off from this webinar. Uh, it might be a good time for you and your family to start taking a look at what you might need to do to get ready for hurricane season. So that's all we have for the for the presentation part of this uh, webinar. Here are some links that you can visit, the National Hurricane Center uh, link there, www.hurricanes.gov. You can get latest on the hurricane forecasts. Uh, you can go to the National Weather Service site there, www.weather.gov, to get your local forecast uh, all times of the year, not just during hurricane season, and then the hurricane preparedness website uh, that I just talked about. So with that, I guess I will turn it back over to Dan and Andy, who will start throwing some of your questions at us, and we can uh, try and answer them. Yeah, Robbie, um, I was going to throw it to Andy first, but I think we've got the audio worked out for Nikki, I hope. I see it has a green light next to my, or the, on the panel. So if you want to uh, tell us a little bit about what you do and, and uh, talk about flying into hurricanes, I saw a question about you know, are you scared when you fly in? So maybe you want to talk about that, then I'm going to go off screen and send it over to Andy for the next question. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes. Awesome. All right. Sorry about the technical difficulties, guys. Um, so like Robbie was saying, um, I'm a flight director for the NOAA Hurricane Hunters, and we are out of Lakeland, Florida. Uh, you can see some of those planes that she was talking about. I fly on both of those. Those are the G4 Jet and the P3, one of our P3s. We do have two of them. Um, but what is it like to fly into a hurricane? Um, I am fairly new to the job, um, but I have flown through a hurricane twice. And when I did fly through, it was a little bumpy. So if you like roller coaster rides, then it would probably be something you would enjoy. But it's definitely a little bit bumpy, especially when you're going through the eye of the storm, um, the eye wall. But once you get into the eye, like Robbie was saying, it's cool, calm, and collected usually. You see the blue skies, and that's when you get a little bit of a break before you go out the other side of the hurricane. Um, and is it scary? Um, if you don't like roller coasters or kind of getting jostled around a little bit, then probably not something you would like to do for a living. Um, but it's not scary, in my opinion, just because we have an excellent team working on board the aircraft to make sure that we're staying safe as possible. And that's a team of pilots. They're making sure the aircraft is what it has to be. We have engineers and technicians in the back making sure when we deploy our drop zones that those are being done so in the best and safest manner possible. Instructors like myself, we're watching the radar on board the aircraft and looking ahead and trying to see what type of storms we're going to be going through and what, what types of updrafts or big gusts of winds that we would be going through or downdraft, things like that. We're, we're definitely maintaining that situational awareness is what we call it to make sure we're doing the best job as safely as we can. So that's a great question. We get asked that a lot, but teamwork really uh, keeps us safe and we work together to make sure we're doing the best job we can. All right, thank you, Nikki. Uh, so we have been getting hundreds of questions here and uh, we try to keep up with some of them. Uh, hopefully we're gonna here in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, we'll try to answer some of these combined questions uh, as everybody kind of asking same theme kind of questions. The first one I'm gonna ask is for um, some of the folks at the weather forecast office. Lauren, maybe uh, you can answer this question. Um, a lot of people have been asking about uh, can hurricanes be followed by tornadoes or maybe preceded by tornadoes and can those tornadoes be as strong as hurricanes? Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, excellent. 
Um, yeah, so this is a great question. We get it a lot. Um, you know, the difference between hurricanes and tornadoes um, and then how they, they go together because in some cases they do. Um, what happens a lot once you get a hurricane moving inland is you get the hurricane, it's very large usually, can be up to you know, 500 miles across um, or even larger in some cases. Those outer bands of that hurricane, those add a lot of spin to the atmosphere. And so those can actually provide an environment where tornadoes could spin up and where tornadoes could develop. And actually inland in areas um, like Charlotte, for example, that was an area where when Nate came through in 2017, it was just a very weak tropical storm. So not something where we would think the winds would be really dangerous anymore, but the rain bands of Nate actually created uh, multiple tornadoes in our area. Um, we had almost 20 tornadoes actually moved through South and North Carolina, um, and those actually did a lot of damage. Um, so tornadoes are much smaller in scale than hurricanes. They're very tiny compared to our hurricane, um, usually not more than 500 yards to a mile across. Um, but the winds can be very strong. The winds in a tornado can actually be well over 100, 150 miles an hour. Well, you know, by the time a hurricane or tropical storm makes it inland, usually the winds are down to about 35, 40 miles an hour. Not always, um, but usually the tornadoes inland produce much more wind damage than a hurricane would inland. All right, I'm going to pass it back over to Dan here for the next question. Thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, there's lots, uh, just so many questions coming in. I agree with you, Andy, probably more than we've had on any webinar to date. So it's, uh, it's a little crazy trying to get to everything. Uh, but one here I was going to send, and I have some for Bob in a minute, but I was going to send this one over to Robbie and John. Uh, uh, maybe John's uh, best to hear for this first one. Uh, lots of questions about naming, just tons of questions about how do we name storms. Uh, one of my favorites here, though, was from Kristen that said, do you ever uh, use uh, hurricane names twice? So I'll let you talk about the naming and then whether or not they ever get reused. So Kristen, yeah, let's actually the names do get reused most of the time. Let's talk about that. So the naming process, you can actually check it out for yourself. If you go to hurricanes.gov, you can actually see what the names are for 2020, 2021, all the way for the next six years. And the reason that's done is the names repeat every six years. They're just rotating lists. Now, the names won't repeat, Kristen, if the storm is really bad and produced a lot of damage and unfortunately a lot of deaths, then the name gets retired. And then we come up with the replacement name for that retired storm, and that's done through the World Meteorological Organization. Now, of course, the naming process was done, and I think we mentioned this earlier, just to help us communicate about hurricanes, as I think people much more relate to names than if we just said hurricane over the Western Atlantic or hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's a little bit about how it works, Kristen. Hopefully that answered the question. Thanks, John. The next question I have for Bob. Uh, so we've had a bunch of questions about the weather balloons. Uh, so how do they help you in forecasting? Uh, and do you get the balloons back? And also how uh, to actually watch a launch there at your office? Oh, so, yeah, we... Like I mentioned before, we um, we release the balloons twice a day from from the office here. We blow the balloons up uh, with helium. Um, you can watch. We have a, a video on our YouTube uh, channel. You can get through our website weather.gov forward slash chs to watch this. Um, and we do have some opportunities where folks can come out to the office to participate. Unfortunately, now with the current situation with the virus, we can't do that. But hopefully in the near future, we can get more people to come out. Um, but we we set up a little instrument package. I wish I had one with me uh, to show you, um, but it's called a radio sign. And that instrument package goes up, we measure temperature, pressure, um, winds and humidity. And like I said, that goes up, we can track it up for about 20 miles high in the sky takes a couple hours usually to, to track it. Um, we get that data back. Um, GPS helps to track it and, and, and um, send that information back to us. And that data goes into our computer models. There's all different kinds of computer models that we use to forecast the regular, the normal weather. Also, of course, during um, hurricane situations. Um, but really, 
you know, we're all down and we live down on the ground and we think uh, all the weather happens down here. Well, really a lot of what drives the weather near the ground is, is because of what happens high up in the, in the sky. So we use that data to, to um, collect and to get in the computer models. All right, thanks. Uh, hand it back to Dan here. Thanks, uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, I have a question here. I was going to send over to Robbie. Um, it, it says the person that's from Trista and says there are future future meteorologists here. So great, uh, great Trista. Hope uh, hope you make that uh, happen. Uh, study hard in school, and I'm sure you'll get there. But they're asking uh, about uh, how do you tell if it's going to be an active hurricane season? You know, they've heard some things that it might be active this year. So how do we, how do we make those seasonal hurricane forecasts? Yeah, so uh, great question. So there's a lot of different things that we're watching both in the atmosphere and in the ocean to see whether or not it's going to be an active season. But there's a few things that storms like in order to form and to move across the Atlantic. They like warm waters. I think John was talking about that earlier. And they generally like waters about 80 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. Uh, so if the waters are too cold, then hurricanes don't typically like to form. Um, and in some of uh, the first few forecasts that I've seen this year, the waters in the Atlantic are pretty warm. So that could be one uh, hint to us that it might, might be our active season, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, another thing is the wind shear. You may have heard that term before. What is wind shear? Well, as Bob was talking about, we're not just worried about the wind that it's occurring here where we live on the ground, but we're worried about what's happening with the winds all the way up into the atmosphere. And when the winds from the ground all the way up are pretty much blowing in the same direction, the same speed, we see that the wind shear is low. And hurricanes like that sort of environment. They like it when the wind shear is low, when the winds are pretty much the same as you grew up in the atmosphere. The winds are coming from different directions. I kind of think that uh, the storm might get its head chopped off. Yeah, that's not a good thing for storms. And it's good for us, the storm doesn't like it. So we're looking at those wind shear conditions in the atmosphere. Uh, sometimes the wind shear can be higher in events like El Nino. You may have heard that term as well. Uh, or La Nina when the wind shear is low. So there's all these different things that we're watching in the atmosphere and the ocean. And we put them all together. We kind of come up with a forecast of, okay, based on all those conditions, how active do we think the season is going to be? I uh, thought, uh, thought Andy might come back up. Oh, you there, Mine's Andy? Froze. Mine froze up for a second here, but uh, I think I think I can try to get back on here. If not, if not, I have another question. There you are. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, this question I'll ask Nikki. Uh, folks are asking, uh, what kind of degree do you need to do your job, or be a meteorologist, meteorologist in general? That is an awesome question. Um, so. All of us have a degree in meteorology. So we went to college and got a four year undergraduate degree at least. Um, and some of us even have masters and PhDs. Um, but to, have, to essentially get a job as a meteorologist, you at least needed to go to a four year undergraduate program. Um, so, and there's a ton of them around the United States, Florida State, uh, NC State, Oklahoma, Penn State, there, there's a ton. Um, so essentially, no matter where, where you're living, there's something that's probably close by. Um, so that's, that's a great question. And you got to like a lot of math and you got to like a lot of science because that's the that's majority of the four years is a lot of physics and a lot of calculus, some fancy math and science terms that you get to learn more about later on. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, I saw a similar question. So several folks asking and I saw somebody else uh, said they're going to be a future meteorologist. So it sounds like we got a, a lot of folks interested in weather on today. So that's great. I mean, that's why we're getting so many questions. Um, I did see a, a, another question talking about sort of, uh, you know, education opportunities. Uh, I'll send this to Lauren first, maybe over to you, Nikki, as well, uh, asking if there's any volunteer opportunities with, uh, with the Weather Service. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So, yes, is the answer. Um, you know, the situation, again, with the virus is a little bit different right now. Uh, but normally at the Greenville Spartanburg office and at many, many offices across the country, I would say the majority of offices, um, if you are in late high school, sometimes you can you volunteer at an office. If you're in college, in a lot of cases for meteorology, you can actually come and volunteer with the office for the summer. You can start to try to work some shifts with some of the meteorologists, see what it's all about, 
learn a little bit about forecasting um, and that type of stuff. But yeah, usually there are opportunities. Usually my office personally in Greenville, we take um, one to two student volunteers that are in college. Um, but if you're interested in meteorology and let's say you're not in late high school yet or you're not in college yet, we love giving tours and we love having people come and talk to us, ask us questions, uh, maybe shadow us as a meteorologist when we're doing the forecast and find out more about what it's about. Um, so if you go to our website at weather.gov slash GSP, like our office, um, we actually have an education page and you can see some of those opportunities. Again, we can't do tours right now, um, but normally we actually do one or two a week um, during normal times. So when things are a little calmer, we'd love to have you out to our office and teach you more about what meteorology is about. Thanks, Lauren. I'll pass it over to Nikki as well. Uh, you know, and if, even at the Hurricane Center, volunteer opportunities are pretty pretty limited, but we do have, especially the, the college age folks that uh, uh, can get summer internships and things. So. I'm not sure if that's the same at the, your uh, aircraft operations center, Nikki, but uh, I'll let you answer. Yeah, you know, it's, it's pretty similar. Um, most of our student volunteers or internships are going to be for college students. Um, but the cool thing is, is um, with, with the aircraft, and we have nine different planes, we can kind of take them wherever we have to go. There's a lot of different outreach events to get to bring our office essentially to you. Um, so depending on where those events are, sometimes you can get a tour of the aircraft, depending on what part of the United States you live in. Um, so definitely be on the lookout for that. You can follow our social media pages and things to figure out where we might be taking the aircraft to. Obviously, in the current situation, we're, we're staying put at home right now. Um, but once everyone's um, back and up and running, we, we should be going and doing our outreach events like we usually do. So you can always see us there, too, to get a tour. Andy, are you there for the next one, or do you want me to Dan, ask another? Dan, one? you'll have to ask them. My uh, my screen's locked up, so. Sh sure. I I just uh, I mean I just saw this one pop in, which is kind of different and interesting, but it talks about whether or not we need folks to help do computer programming and coding uh, for the job. I see everybody shaking their heads. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody wants to uh, expand on that, uh, but you you certainly can. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, you know, when I sit down to make a forecast, I probably, and John, <laughs> agree with me, we probably have five or six different computers sitting in front of us. So, I mean, we use a lot of computers and we need programmers who know all the different computing languages and can write programs to help us do our job better. Um, in all of our offices, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. So, we know a lot of people that have a meteorology degree and then also maybe double majored in computer science or minored or have a, a concentration in that as well. So. Um, if you are interested in computers and meteorology, I would say, uh, you know, get the education in both because that, that's a great asset for people, both in the National Weather Service within NOAA and in other, other places as well. Yeah, Robbie, and I'll just add, um, and you mentioned earlier that we use computer models to make predictions. Those computer models are all computer programs and codes. So if you're really good at that, I think you can help us in more ways than one and get better at weather prediction. And since you can uh, hear me, John, uh, guys, uh, I'm going to ask John a question. Uh, we heard earlier on in the webinar um, have, about hurricane and steering. Um, there's the perception, like, why do storms hit Florida before they make it up to Georgia? Maybe you can elaborate on how the steering can kind of control where they go. You're on mute, John. Well, we're full of uh, technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah, we haven't had the, these. Uh, all right, Robbie. All the one thing. When it rains, it pours, right? Uh, so, uh, well, Robbie, if you had the question, go ahead. Sure. So, yeah, so, you know, we look at steering currents. I'll go back to the answer I said before. We're looking at the winds and the atmosphere. And uh, the hurricanes pretty much move. If you were to think if you went down to a river or a stream and you saw a leaf fall into the stream, the leaf would just get carried along with the water. And a hurricane is pretty much the same thing. There's all these air currents going on in the atmosphere, and all of those wind currents are pushing the storm along. So sometimes you can have a hurricane hit Florida, uh, and then the way the steering currents are, it can then push that hurricane uh, to the north, to the areas near Georgia or the Carolinas. Um, sometimes we call that recurve. If a storm is coming over the Atlantic, and you'll see on a map it might then bend 
and possibly hit Georgia and the Carolinas or just stay offshore. So, you know, that's one of the critical aspects of a forecast we're trying to look at. And you know, Bob's saying, boo. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're trying to see, is the hurricane going to turn before it hits land, or does the turn not occur soon enough and it ends up hitting land? So that's one of the critical parts of the forecast that we're always watching for. Thanks, Robbie. I think I'll take it, and we're, we're really about out of time, so I hate to go too much longer and over, but we've had so many questions. Maybe we'll do a couple of more really quick ones if we can. Um, one of them, there's really two parts here, so maybe I'll throw it to Robbie and then Bob and Lauren, uh, and then I know if we have a second or two, we could do one final one. But uh, so Robbie, I've gotten some questions about if you could explain a storm surge again a little bit quickly, and then I've gotten some questions too about where the safest place is to ride out a storm. So I was going to send that over to both Bob for talking about maybe the, from the coastal perspective about evacuations and and you know how you need a safe shelter and then maybe Lauren from the inland flood perspective since she's in the inland office. So first to you, Robbie. Sure, yeah, so I'm glad you asked about storm surge again because it is really important to understand it. So think about uh, if you're at the ocean or any body of water and you see wind, well, what's that wind doing? It's pushing the water, okay? It's a force, it's just pushing that water along. And when the wind of a hurricane or even sometimes a tropical storm is strong enough, it can push the water onto land that's normally dry and you can flood that land with the storm surge. So uh, we need to get people out of, the, out of the way. And I'll turn it to Bob now to talk about, you know, when we think there's a threat of storm surge, what is it that you should do if you live near the coast? Yeah, so, um, you know, we try to issue these forecasts and provide the warnings and, uh, and watches to give people a heads up that there's gonna be potential for some flooding and remember that water is, is very heavy and it, it has a lot of weight to it. So it doesn't take a lot of water a lot of times to, to move um, heavy things like cars and, and trucks and things. So um, it has a lot of destructive uh, potential. So what we encourage people to do is um, run, run from the water and hide from the wind. And what we like to say is if you're, you know, really you need to know if you're in a flood prone area and if you are, um, have a way to, to get to a better shelter um, if we're expecting some, some flooding in that area. Remember, it's not just flooding from the ocean, but also the flooding from, um, from the sky, from the rainfall. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider um, and, you know, to think about. Um, but as long as you're in a shelter that's away from that flooding um, and potential from that wind damage as well, um, that's the main thing. It's, it's essentially once you're in a shelter, a strong shelter, it's kind of like a tornado situation where you want to just protect yourself from, um, you know, that high wind damage from a tree potentially falling on the structure or things like that. So like get on the lowest level that's not prone to flooding in an interior room, and that's the best advice that we can give you. Thanks, Bob. I'll throw it to Lauren to see if there's anything different for an inland location, and I'm gonna sign off and say goodbye, and Andy's gonna pop back on for the final question and, and, and wrap up. So thanks again, everyone, but go ahead, Lauren. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I echo a lot of what Bob said, um, you know, when they get the winds down at the coast, um, that's very similar to what you would do up here if one of our main concerns with a tropical system moving inland would be tornadoes, which they do happen. Uh, you know, it just depends a lot on the track of the storm, how it's coming in, um, how strong is it sometimes still. Um, so if it's a storm where we expect tornadoes might form, first of all, we're going to tell you about it at the local level. Um, we're going to hopefully issue a tornado watch. If we think that a tornado is forming, we're going to issue a warning. So we just encourage everybody if there's a tropical system coming and just any time of the year, really, um, you know, know your place where you could go and the lowest level of your home away from doors and windows, things like that to be safe from, you know, really strong winds of a tornado, flying debris, things like that. Um, the other thing that we think about is flooding. And it's pretty unusual in our area that we would have to evacuate, um, you know, where a lot of us are in the mountains or the upstate of the Carolinas or in northeast Georgia. But there are some situations, again, like if you know you live in a flood prone area um, or an area maybe that might get cut off by floodwaters or flooded roads, 
make sure you have a plan to either be able to get to higher ground quickly, maybe have a friend's house, a family member's house, or a safe shelter, um, where if the floodwaters start to come up or we know it might flood, you can go there really quickly. Or also have a plan, you know, maybe your house is okay, but roads are flooded and you can't leave your house. Make a plan to have some food and some water to be okay for at least a couple of days just staying at your house so that you don't have to either, you know, attempt to drive through floodwaters, which we never encourage, or have somebody try to get through floodwaters to come get you and help you. So just make sure you could be okay in your house for at least a couple of days with food and water and things like that. Thank you, Lauren. And on that note, I think we're out of time and have to wrap everything up. I think that was really good advice, Lauren, about how to be hurricane ready for the season. I just want to thank everybody for attending. Hopefully you enjoyed the webinar. Remember, on the page there, you can see some resources to get more information. And I want to pass it to Robbie lastly to tell him how to get in, how to get this on an archive in YouTube. Yeah, so we're going to be uploading this webinar recorded up onto our YouTube channel. It'll be www.youtube.com slash NWSNHC. Uh, so we plan to have that up uh, later this week so you can rewatch it again or tell your friends about it. Uh, also, if you tell your friends, we have another webinar for your area on Thursday. So go back to the info page uh, and have them sign up if they weren't on this one. So again, thanks everybody for joining us and uh, be safe and healthy. Take care, everybody. Thanks for the great questions. Thanks, Nikki, Lauren, and Bob.